So they told me to keep you awake. That this is the this is the challenging time. So I, my job is just to keep you awake. Uh, I it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, always uh, love uh, Paris. It's a wonderful city, and it's just uh, it's a real honor to be able to uh, speak to you today. I am going to talk about um, complexity, and so I want to just start off. By, and this is something that is really directed toward the students because all of the older of us are not uh, going to be able to really get answers to all of these questions. But the youthful here hopefully will be able to, to answer some of the, the important questions. But just stop for a moment and think about yourself as an individual. You are, in effect, an ongoing experiment in longevity. It's not a reproducible experiment, and it has an N of 1. This is really the problem of personalized medicine. So all of our experiments that we do, where we average animals or average outcomes in a cell experiment or a model organism, it's really an average. As an in, all of the epidemiologic studies are really some sort of an average. You as an individual, however, are an individual. And so this is a real problem in how we approach science. And it, I want to give an example of this that really drives home this point. And it's a very simple one. We all know, we're all familiar with the LD50, lethal dose 50. So if we take cyanide, for instance, now... We all know how cyanide kills, inhibits cytochrome oxidase, inhibits respiration, inhibits ATP production, and we can't survive. But getting back to that point of complexity, even though we think we know the mechanism of cyanide toxicity and cyanide killing, if we give, if we take a mouse and give that mouse the LD50 of cyanide, we can be absolutely certain that we cannot predict whether that animal will live or die. This is complexity. We know the mechanism, and yet we don't know the mechanism. And so that's really what has possessed me for the past several years in science, is trying to figure out how we're going to go forward dealing with personalized medicine with that issue of complexity. So I'm going to talk a little bit today. I'm not going to give a whole lot of data. It's mostly conceptual. Uh, the first part I'm going to talk about, uh, let's see, I have this outlined here. Uh, first part I'm going to talk about the sort of historic over the last decade or so where we've w worked on this problem of oxidative stress and redefining oxidative stress in terms of the complexity then I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are right now in terms of redox proteomics. And then I want to end up with what I think will become the future, and that is a way to operationalize things with regard to personalized medicine. And that's in terms of metabolic profiling. So this is what I consider the old way of thinking. And that is that if we could only get McDonald's and the other places that serve this kind of stuff to eat, if we could only get them to serve some fine wine, we'd be fine. We wouldn't really have all of the health problems that we have. And I think that really illustrates the problem because, indeed, it's far more complex than just simply adding something to correct a, uh, another problem. So where we started on this was uh, now many years ago, 15 years ago or so, we started with a, an effort to measure that balance or imbalance of oxidative stress. And so the way we did that was looking at glutathione and glutathione disulfide. We developed methods so we could reliably measure this in, in the plasma of humans with the idea that this would give us a readout of that balance of oxidative stress. Now, we, in this, I'm not going to go into the details, but we use a, the, a Nernst potential calculation based upon these just simply because it's, the stoichiometry is two glutathiones to, to one glutathione disulfide. 
uh, values uh, I'll get back to in a little bit, but uh, they're just going to be the, the, the calculated values from this equation. Uh, I will talk a little bit about some of the data that we've obtained with uh, these redox western blots where we can measure the redox state of the different forms of thyroidoxin as, as well as a number of other proteins. So it's a very straightforward way to uh, measure the redox states of proteins. So the, this is perhaps the, the most important observation. And this was one that we made back in, in the mid-90s, did not actually publish it until 2000. But the observation was that when we measured the glutathione redox potential in plasma, in human plasma, at the same time, we got a measurement of the cysteine, cysteine redox potential in human plasma. Now, according to this concept of a balance and, and an imbalance, that concept of oxidative stress, we're thinking about everything as a overall viewpoint of, of the system, whereas what this data showed was that the cysteine redox potential is not in equilibrium with, I mean, the glutathione redox potential is not in equilibrium with the cysteine redox potential. So it, took, it actually took me years to believe this data because this is a system where it's, you don't have the problem of tissue where you could say, okay, there's a compartmentalization problem. This is one, one aqueous compartment. This is plasma. And this is approximately, the data are approximately it's showing that the cysteine and glutathione couples are approximately two orders of magnitude out of equilibrium. So it's not a little bit out. It's substantially out of equilibrium. So this really, this observation really drives all aspects of thiol disulfide systems. Because if these two low molecular weight thiol disulfides are not equilibrating in an aqueous system, then it means that we cannot make that assumption on any other thiol system in the cell. And so there are over 200,000 cysteines encoded in the human genome. And so this is a big problem in terms of how we think about the whole process of oxidative, uh, oxidation reduction processes in biology. So that led me to, uh, to propose uh, back in 2006 that we should redefine oxidative stress, that we basically should abandon this concept and we should replace it with one of a, uh, of a concept of a redox circuitry. That is, thinking about things in terms of the way electrons are transferred between biomolecules. And it's unfortunate Helmut Cease is, is uh, not here. Helmut and I have talked about this extensively. And basically, it's not, it's not completely throwing away this concept. It's just recognizing that there's no global balance or imbalance that we can talk about. We have to talk about things in terms of specific redox circuits. So there's a number of different um, concepts that we've developed over the years, and I'm not going to go through the, the research on this. There's many publications uh, on this. But the, the, some of these, this number two is the one I just uh, emphasized. The, the glutathione, cysteine, and thyroidoxin systems are not equilibrated in biologic systems. And so, therefore, we cannot be talking about you know, a single concept of a redox balance. Um, a second, I'll show you uh, in a minute, just conceptually, the redox potential of the glutathione couple is progressively oxidized in the life cycle of cells. Um, another that is a, a, appears to be a, a very universal uh, reality, and that is that the file systems in general are kinetically limited. So that there is a, it's relatively slow electron flux through the systems, constantly going to hydrogen peroxide or oxygen, other electron acceptors. But basically, all of the thiols are in this constant non-equilibrium state. And at least everything we've measured indicates that that's the case. Um, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about the compartmentation. Uh, the, the, the mitochondrial and nuclear compartments are most reducing, at least in terms of the thyroid oxygen systems. Uh, the ER is intermediate between the cytoplasm and the extracellular space, which is most oxidized. 
Um, it's very important the glutathione and cysteine redox potentials are regulated outside of the cells. And so we generally don't think about this because we, we, there's not apparent reduction systems in the extracellular compartment. But if we think about the range of reducing potential from NADPH, about minus 400 millivolts, to oxygen, about probably plus 600 millivolts, that's a range of 1,000 volts. When we measure young, healthy people, the standard deviation is only about plus or minus 10 millivolts. So the biologic range is relatively huge compared to how much the actual range is of fluctuation in the plasma. So these are highly regulated at those non-equilibrium states. And I won't go into the, any, any of the work on the, the um, human data, but we have a, there's probably 20 papers or so with the number of different chronic disease processes where there, the data show that there's associations between the glutathione and or the cysteine redox potential and the disease processes. So one of the concepts I just mentioned was in, in terms of the uh, life cycle of cells. Um, in general, proliferating, highly proliferating cells are more reducing than differentiated cells, and differentiated cells are more reducing than apoptotic cells. I have here on, this, on a redox scale with the equivalent of a diphyol to disulfide ratio if we had a protein that had a, uh, a diphyol motif with a minus 200 millivolt midpoint potential, it would be about 100 to 1 diphyol to disulfide here in the proliferating state, it would be about 1 to 10 in the opposite direction in the apoptotic cell. So it's really telling us that there's enough of a redox range to control metabolism in, in, a, in an important way in terms of, of protein thiols. Now, this uh, shows the, how, the, how these are arranged in terms of the thyroidox and the glutathione cysteine couples. Uh, mitochondria are the most reducing. Uh, the cell nuclei are similar to the mitochondria in terms of the thyroidoxin system. Uh, in the cytoplasm, it's a little bit more oxidized, and then as you go on in the different couples in the cytoplasm, the glutathione is more oxidized than the thyroidoxin, and the cysteine is more oxidized than the glutathione. And then in the uh, plasma, you see the values coming down here. So this, is, this tells you uh, the uh, range from about minus 360 millivolts to about minus 60 millivolts down here. Now what's important is that in terms of the proteins, they really do behave differently in the different compartments. And you can see that here on the right-hand side with this redox western block of uh, thyroidoxin 2. This is a mitochondrial protein. We expressed this protein with a truncated form, so it was... It, it did not go in, it did not have the mitochondrial uh, targeting sequence, so it was expressed in the, in the cytoplasm. And you can see as you increase hydrogen peroxide exposure, the mitochondrial form, the, mito, the mitochondrial lo localized form is oxidized at a, at a lower uh, peroxide concentration. So in the cytoplasm, it's more resistant. And again, this reflects that difference in the compartments with regard to the uh, oxidation. This is at least partially due to the, to the pH difference, because the pH is more, uh, is, is more alkaline in the, uh, in the mitochondria. So this gives us a scale of, uh, uh, like the one I already mentioned on the diphyl to disulfide, what the ratios would be for a given protein. If you took a protein here, minus 210 midpoint potential, if you took that protein and equilibrated it with the thyroidoxin system in the mitochondria, it would be 100,000 to 1 reduced to oxidized, where if you took that same protein and put it in the plasma equilibrated with the cysteine and cysteine, it would be effectively 1 to 100,000. So indeed, the redox potential range is substantial with regard to being able to control the thiol uh, status of the proteins. Okay, so this is the way this is the way I'm thinking about this now, is that within the compartments, the there are different redox nodes, so there are different types of oxidants and different types of reductants, and so depending upon where how a a protein or a specific cysteine is in a protein is interacting, 
there will actually be a, uh, a, an interaction or an, uh, a network interaction that's, act that's driven by the oxidants and the reductants of that specific protein. Now what this means is that a protein that's expressed in the nucleus is going to have a different control than in the cytoplasm. And one that is oxidized by hydrogen peroxide is going to be, have a different control than if it's oxidized by cysteine. Uh, and similarly, if it's reduced by glutathione, it's going to be different than if it's reduced by thyroid oxin. So this then gives us an organizational structure for the redox systems within cells. It's compartmentalized, and it's linked to the different types of oxidants and different types of reductants. I realize this, is, this complicates things tremendously, but I think this is, this is reality. So I want to talk a little bit about where we are on the redox proteomics. So we've devoted a big effort to try to to understand this and actually to test this concept. So what we've done is uh, used a uh, modification of the ICAT method uh, for labeling where we take a cell extract, we uh, react with the uh, isotope coded affinity tag, the heavy form, then we remove that, reduce the, the protein with TCEP, and then react it with the light ICAT. And then we treat with trypsin and do the uh, LCMSMS. And so what we can do with this approach then is get the percent uh, oxidation of specific cysteines in different peptides. And then since the peptides can often be linked back to, the, to specific proteins, then we can look at the fractional oxidation or the percent oxidation of specific cysteines in specific proteins. Using this approach, we can get about 2,000 peptides in a single experiment. And it has the advantage that since you're not combining any, you're not combining two different cell extracts, you're just looking at one, that it has this internal control because you're, you're now expressing the reduced or the oxidized to the reduced form within the same sample. And so it allows you to be able to compare percent oxidation between biological samples. Um, now, what we have found from this, which was really a bit of a surprise, is that as we've gone through and looked at the specific cysteines that we are detecting and measuring, and looked at their conservation in vertebrates, what we find is that, and actually it's not, uh, yeah, so this, these are all vertebrates in this study. We find that those cysteines are very highly conserved, whereas the overall, there's about 72% of the amino acids in general are conserved. There's 94, 93 to 94% of those cysteines that we're measuring are being conserved. Now this is, this is a shock. Because most people are thinking about the cysteines, all of these cysteines on the surface of proteins, maybe having some nonspecific function as an antioxidant. But what this is suggesting is that the data are really, that, that these cysteines are really highly conserved on the surface of the proteins. And this, is, uh, this goes along the lines of, of work that was, uh, was from several years ago uh, from Masetta and Satora where they found that if, you, if one looked at the, at the uh, expected percentage of cysteines uh, due to the transfer RNAs, we'd expect about 3.3% of all of the amino acids to be cysteines. But in fact, there's a, a selective pressure against that because there's really no organism that has 3.3% of the, of the amino acids as cysteines. So there's a selection against the cysteine. So indeed, it's a problem to have these if you don't, don't need them. But what's really interesting about their data is that there is, uh, with the evolution of complexity, there's an increase in the amount of cysteines and the percentage of cysteines in the proteins, suggesting that those cysteines indeed have a function. So we've begun to look at the question then of that, of the potential of that function. And this is an experiment and it's, uh, it's, it's under review now, so hopefully it will be accepted at some point. Um, this is an experiment with HT29 cells, which is grown in culture, where 
they're, they're not treated. They're, these are just control conditions. This is where we start. No particular oxidative stress. And when we, when we did this analysis, what we found was that the, on average uh, of all of the peptides that we were measuring, they're about 84% oxidized. And this, is, this was just really unexpected. We, you know, I was thinking that we would see basically everything would be reduced, and when we treated it with oxidant, we'd see things oxidized. But you can see that uh, there's only a very small fraction of protein cysteines that are mostly reduced, uh, in 90, 95 to 99% reduced. Most of the cysteines have a much higher percentage oxidation. Now, what we found when we used ingenuity pathway analysis was that the most reduced proteins map to certain functional pathways. In this case, in the cytoplasm, you see this very strong association of most highly reduced proteins with the cytoskeletal proteins. The most highly oxidized proteins, again, these are under control conditions. They're not being hammered with something. Under controlled conditions, the most highly oxidized proteins are ones that are in cell signaling and control functions. See these in protein synthesis and 14.33 docking proteins and lipid metabolism and even the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. In the nucleus, the most highly reduced proteins are associated with the RAN GTPase that's controlling protein import into the nucleus something that's been known for a long time to be important, in, to be regulated in a redox way and to be sensitive to oxidative stress. So what this is really telling us is that there's a redox organization in the cell. And that redox organization somehow is being controlled, and it's, not, it's in a functional way, but it's not necessarily in what we would think of as biochemical pathways or even necessarily signaling pathways but it has some type of other, other type of organizational structure. So the way I think this, uh, th what I think this is telling us is, is illustrated here in the thyroidoxin example. Thyroidoxin has two cysteines in the active site. There are three additional cysteines in this protein. And what has been known now for years is that all three of these cysteines, these other cysteines, have functions. So I think that the, the global picture that we're getting from the redox proteomics is that that's probably true of most of the cysteines that we have, that they have evolved functions. They are not active site functions. They probably have, it's par part of the organization and regulation of the way the, the cell metabolism works. So I have that conceptualized here in, in term, what, I, what I call orthogonal regulation. And I usually get some type of a smirk when I use that term orthogonal because most people don't, aren't quite sure what it means. Uh, it means something in, opposite, in opposition to the direction, perpendicular if you think about it. Um, so if we think about different signaling pathways, for instance kinase pathways or redox signaling pathways or ionic signaling pathways, these, these will have active sites, they will have a specific defined pathway. But each of the proteins within these will have multiple other cysteines. And those multiple other cysteines then provide a way to organize these pathways and actually control those pathways depending upon the cell type and, in fact, even within the cell, the location. And so the concept of this orthogonal, orthogonal control is that these other cysteines in the proteins are being regulated by the thyroidoxin and glutathione systems in opposition to hydrogen peroxide and other oxidants, as well as other types of modifications of the systems like nitrosylation, glutathionylation, and so forth, that actually provides an integration, the so-called crosstalk of signaling pathways. I think that's what this rep represents. There are many different modifications of cysteines that are known. I mentioned the nitrosylation, glutathionylation, cystinylation. So there's sulfhydration. There's, there can be thiohemiacetal formation. A uh, number of different modifications, such as zinc binding. You can have disulfide formation. 
can have the, the proteins tethered to cytoskeleton. You can have acylation and, and actually linking to membranes through hydrophobic regions. And even in terms of the DNA binding, you can have redox-sensitive sites in the DNA binding of transcription factors. So I think this is very, really very central to the way redox uh, processes are organized in cells, and that this really is what demands that we think farther than just an imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants. How are we doing on time? One minute. One minute. All right. All right, so we'll, we will go to this. You only need one minute on this. Where we are now on the high-performance metabolic profiling, I won't go through the methodology. Um, we can now, in a 20-minute analysis, measure 7,000 chemicals in a drop of human blood. And uh, I think that's going to be transformative in terms of what we can do in terms of personalized medicine. And this is why. Uh, Bruce Ames already showed this picture. This is a different form. <laughs> this is the keg metabolic path pathway. There are in the keg pathway there are 1,485 metabolites. You can see the black dots here. These are the matches. So we effectively cover metabolism in a 20-minute analysis. This is going to be transformative with regard to what we can do in terms of human health because now we can look pretty much at all of metabolism in a single 20-minute analysis. Um, well, I don't have time. This is what it looks like in the mitochondria. Not quite as many, but you can see the pathways. We capture metabolites in 136 out of 154 metabolic pathways of the keg pathways in a single analysis of isolated mitochondria. And so I will end there with the conclusions. Uh, I think oxidative stress has to be viewed as a disruption of these redox circuits, uh, that the cysteine proteome is highly conserved and it's organized into functional redox networks that really have not been defined at, at present, and that I think where we are in terms of the high-resolution mass spectrometry is that we, we really are going to be looking at, not at one thing at a time, but we're going to be looking at metabolism. Lots of people contributed to this, and uh, I'll stop there and uh, be happy to take any questions. If Say anything about the other uh, thiol amino acid, the thiol, the thiol. Okay. And it's been reported that uh, methionine may be more susceptible to oxidation than cysteine, in fact, in certain systems. So are you turning any of your attention to that system and comparing it with the system, I think uh, that could be uh, an important... Uh... Right. So the, the, the question on methionine is really very important. And you're absolutely right. The methionines are oxidized. And every time we look at them, uh, we can see that there's a steady state oxidation. There's almost always a mixture of the methionine, methionine sulfoxide. The challenge is really analytical. Um, we, uh, the, you can look at the global, uh, Earl Statman did that to now years ago develop methods to look at the global status of methionine oxidation in proteins. But to get them specifically in the different peptides uh, is, is not, you know, in a, in a quantitative way, as far as I know, hasn't been done. We developed a clever scheme to do it. We haven't achieved it yet. So uh, hopefully it will be there. You didn't say much about the chemistry, I know you're showing the time. Yeah. But if there's an amino group next to a sulfide group, it makes it more easily oxidized. And so can you predict, based on uh, context, which ones are going to be oxidized and which ones are not? So we looked at that. And unfortunately, it did not pan out in our data. We did not see any dependence of, as far as a location in the peptide sequence. So I don't know whether that means that it's really the three-dimensional aspect that's critical because, of course, we lose that in the way we analyze this. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that it actually could all be enzymatically controlled, that there could be protein-protein interactions. So the proteins are actually in this type of a network that they're actually oxidizing each other. 
because these are very slow reactions. These aren't like the usual enzymatic reactions that we think about. These are slow. And so it could be that there's some type of a, um, autocatalytic type of a mechanism that's actually doing this. It's a very difficult one to, to think about. So keep one, which is the sensor yeah. for uh, self oxidation, is all surrounded by basin groups. Right. So, and then you can have a disulfide that can form it all and all these yeah. Well, I, I agree. And I think this is, uh, for the students who are thinking about projects, this is absolutely a wonderful project to be thinking about because what has been looked at so far in terms of the cysteine proteome is, is really those highly reactive ones like the ones in the KEEP that are in, involved in signaling functions. What this data is suggesting is that Essentially, all of the cysteines on the surface of the proteins are probably interactive, they're probably functional, but they're not so reactive. They're much slower, and they're much more difficult to study because of that, because it's, it's been what biochemists have considered artifact for the past 50 years. And then you have selenium. So selenium yeah, selenium. is much more right. easy. Yeah, and it, so if you have copper bound to these instead of zinc, it also is going to change uh, the reaction. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. As you said, there are, there are many of the reactions with thiols, like the range, the gray constant, from very 10 to 7. To yeah, four. right. So some of the reactions will be extremely fast, and you might have a molecular response before the system equilibrates. That's right. So what you're looking at is, is an overall trend over time of changes that overall will take some change to occur. So we have like two velocities in my view. Yeah. Something that goes fast, that we do something, and then a process that takes a little bit of time to equilibrate. Yeah. So from the thermodynamic point of view that you showed, as you showed, how much time one would expect, how much is the inertia of the system before it re-equilibrates? And I would like to stress that re-equilibration may not necessarily tell us about physiological responses, because physiological responses may rely on the fast reactions. So right. I know that you agree with yeah. this. So, yeah. Just can you illustrate? So I think it's a complete continuum. I think there are some things that respond within seconds. But in general, these type of responses are over minutes. Um, We've done diurnal variation studies. So in humans, uh, just following eating, for instance, the, the sulfur amino acid intake from the meals changes things over a period of hours. And that's occurring within. And so we actually have that type of a change within us as we go, you know, as we fight jet lag. Uh, but those, those type of processes are ongoing. And I think it is, in fact, a continuum that is partially in a non-enzymatic, very rapid rate, but then a lot of it is probably these very slow network type of interactions that have evolved and uh, control things, but they're just not things that we have been able to conceptualize and actually experimentally analyze. Thank you. Mm -hmm.